Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. And uh, it's a pleasure this morning to really, a, not to say the other topics weren't fascinating, but this is gonna be a very fascinating topic that Marina will introduce in a moment that we have Professor Cohen with us about, can we live forever? Can we cure old age? It's fascinating from a scientific standpoint, but also what the theological implications of it are. I assume we're going to deal more with the science today, but it's definitely going to be very thought provoking for us as um, thinking dedicated Jewish people as well. So I just want to thank uh, Marina, who's officially hosting, uh, despite what it might say, uh, that's not Rabbi Daniel Cohen over there. Uh, that's uh, that's Marina Sapir. So Shkoach for uh, moderating this session, for opening it up. And uh, welcome to everyone who's with us this morning in our partnership with Bar Ilan. We're gonna pass the baton over to Marina who will introduce our speaker. And uh, thank you all for being with us this morning at Aguda Shalom. Uh, thank you, thank you Rabbi Kurz. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Chaim Cohen for being with us. And uh, Professor Cohen has PhD in uh, Genetic Hebrew University and postdoc at Harvard Medical School in David uh, Sinclair lab. And uh, Sinclair was announced as a, one of the 100 most influential people in the world, by the way, and uh, established uh, 14 biotech companies on aging. Since 2004, Professor Chaim Cohen, head of the lab of molecular mechanism of aging at Baralan University, and also the head of uh, Segol uh, Center of Human Health uh, Longevity, and the head of the Israel Germany Minerva uh, Center of Mechanism of Aging. He has also a guest professor at Harvard Medical School and published in Nature Science and Center and cited more than 140,000 times. So uh, we, are very, we are very excited and the topic is very, very interesting and I will spotlight you for everyone. And uh, um, again, thank you for being with us. Good morning. Can you see the presentation and can you hear me well? Excellent. Yeah, let me just make it full screen. Let's start. And I hope now you can see it well. Okay, so then I'm going to talk about the development of IDH drug. It's about the work that we did in my lab, but before we start it, I want to show you the change in the median lifespan, which means within the society of each country in America, how many, how many people are behind, below age, are below the 50% of age. And you can see this between 1960 to 2060, and it's going from green, which is thin, blue, which is 50s. And if you can see here, America is going to be red in less than 20 years meaning that in less than 20 years, about third of the population will be above age 50. If you look here, this is the change across the globe in the maximum lifespan. And again, this is not only America, this you can see in Israel, you can see in Europe, you can see in Africa and all over the world, we have, there is a change in human lifespan that goes from the maximum lifespan in the US was about 65. In 1960, it's going to be almost 90 in 2060. This, of course, faces us with many challenges. And the first challenge that uh, we face is the ratio between people who, are, who retired and people who are still working. This is the average in Europe. There's different countries in Europe, EU 27. It's before United Kingdom left the EU. And in 2010, there was four people who are still working to one person who, is, uh, who retired. In 2060, it's one to two, meaning that one to two, or let's say differently, a third of the population will be retired. This of course faces with many challenges. You can mention any challenge that you have in mind. I just mentioned a few of them, the dependence will, Actually, so 
third of the population is now depend on the other two thirds of the population. There is increase in illness, and I will speak about it in, in, a, in a, few, a few slides. You have a significant portion of the population that have significant experience, but they cannot express themselves. They become frustrated, they become bored. So you can create a, a very long list of challenges as you choose. Since I'm uh, teaching young students, it's very difficult to explain to them what are the challenge in, uh, in change in the pyramid of ages in the population. The way that I'm doing it, it's very simple. My, my student, the average age of my student is between 20 to 30, just to give you the, the, the range. What I'm telling them that in about 20 years from now, they are going to sit or the equivalent of them going to sit in the little cedar and they're going to be the parents, the grandmother, the grand grandmother, and so on, what we call Safta Rabba, Safta Rabba Rabba. And each one of them is going to ask them when you're going to get married. And once I'm telling this, they understand exactly what are the challenges that we need to face when a human lifespan increase. So since we are doing biology and we're focusing on aging, I would like to speak about the effect of aging in age, on age-related diseases. So as you can see here, it doesn't matter which disease you're checking, in all of them, as we age, the frequency or the incidence of a disease increase uh, stoichiometrically. For example, here we, we can look on the frequency of chronic diseases in the individuals above age 65, and you can see that about 80% have at least one of these chronic diseases, meaning that one out of 80% uh, of people above age 65 would either have hypertension, high cholesterol, have the depression, have chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and so on. And if you want to, to ask what is the frequency of two of them, it's almost 70% of individuals above age 65 will suffer two out of these 10 chronic conditions. I don't need to, to mention it here, but if you think about old individuals, we know that many of them, the statistic is that above age 65, 10% of have or develop what's called frailty syndrome. Frailty syndrome means they're either weak or they walk very slow. When I say walk very slow, it means that we give them to, to walk nine meters and we ask them to do it in less than uh, three seconds and they cannot do it. They, have, they, they, they report that they have very low level of physical activity, they are exhausted and they lose the weight without a diet. And this is 10% of the population about age 65 and almost 30% around age 75 to 80. And you don't need me to, to mention it to you because we all, uh, have the, watched the corona or the COVID-19 in the last two years, and we saw the influence of aging on death ratio to people who got uh, corona. For example, this was taken, I think this is from China in the beginning, you remember, it started from China like two years ago. Actually, it's, it's in, this, in my neighborhood, it started the run for him. So it's almost two years for the COVID-19. And this is the blue, is the frequency of cases and the orange is the frequency of, uh, of deaths due to COVID-19. And it really didn't change uh, in the last two years. As more old you are, the chance to die from corona increase. So aging is the first or primary risk factor for significant or let's say numerous number of age related disease, including cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer and so on. Once we will be able to understand the mechanism that underlying aging, underlying a healthy aging, we'll be able to influence the frequency of all these diseases. We'll be able to, to influence the frequency of frailty and we'll be able to, to allow, to enable all these people who have a lot of experience, a lot of that can contribute a lot to society and make them much more active much more part of the society and really contribute all the wisdom that they accumulate 
during the lifespan. This is very nice to say, but we need to find what is the mechanisms that control the rate of aging and how and how it's influenced the, the development of age-related diseases. It's not so easy simply because aging is a very complex condition. Just imagine in each in each one of us, we have myriad of cells. Each cell age differently, each tissue age differently. I think we're all familiar with somebody who is still sharp, is age 95, his brain is work completely fine, but his blood system is not so fine, he has some heart disease and so on. Vice versa, you know, individuals who are age 40 and the, let's say 50 or 60, and the brain is not so sharp as before, but the blood system is excellent. So each tissue develop aging a different rate, and each individual develop aging in a different rate. So our challenge is, is how to find the, what we call the Archimedes point of aging, the point that we can affect, that we can affect the very common basic mechanism of aging that is common to every, to, that's happening in each individual or happening in each cell and actually influence many pathways of aging that we are aware of. Now, that was a very nice uh, speech, but it's not so easy if you want to look on the evolution of age. Why do I mention evolution? Because as a biologist, if I want to understand a mechanism of phenomena, I can go to the evolution of this phenomena and ask myself, what are the criteria that help to develop this condition? Now, if I compare the aging, or let's say the survival curve of human or any organism under protected environment, it's completely different from the survival curve of organism in nature. For example, in mice, in a, our animal facility, we survive up to three years. In the wild, they die even before they reach three months of old, three months old, six months old. 95% of them die before they reach 30% of the potential lifespan. So if you want to understand the evolution, we have a, we have a challenge because if you look here, there is no population that age in nature. If so, we cannot understand what are the evolution of aging. More than that, whoever reaches this age in, in the wild you know, are not fertile. It really don't, don't help them to transfer this benefit to the next generation. So how do you understand aging when you speak about the uh, mechanism of aging in biology? The way to understand it is that we take the, the understanding that we, the, the knowledge that we accumulate from here, meaning the knowledge that we, in nature, we are not expected to survive more than 30% of our life. And comparing to the fact that indeed in human or in modern lifespan, we survive up to almost 90, 90 to 80 to 100% of potential lifespan. Meaning that we can divide our life to younger than 30 and above 30 or what we expected to survive and what's really happened in modern uh, period in modern history. When you speak about what we are expected to survive, younger than 30, this will be under tight selection. So everything that happened here will be highly regulated. Everything that happened here will be, will be not regulated. In other words, it could be that some excellent or let's say good processes that happen when we are young will affect us as we age and cause us to get old because nobody stopped them. Another option is that since we are so calibrated to survive up to age 30, we are not calibrated to survive to older ages. For example, if we, if we fix mutation in, in, in some rate of DNA repair, this will be enough to survive to age 30, but it's not going to be enough to survive later. Let's uh, demonstrate it in a different way. It's good. We can look at it in this uh, theory, for example. We accumulate mutation during the lifespan. In the beginning, it's a very small amount of mutation, but as we become more and more old, we accumulate more and more mutation. And the effect is like a snowball. At the end, the, the body collapsed. This is one way to look at it. Another way to look, to look at it, it's like this, uh, this game. So you have to, every time you take a piece of, a piece of wood, till 
the tower collapsed. That's exactly what's happened. We have one mutation, second mutation, three mutation. At the end, your body is collapsing and you get become old. This is one theory of aging. Another theory of aging, we call it antagonism pleiotropic, meaning that the things which are very good at young age, nobody stops them, they continue to happen at old age and actually they are bad and they cause aging. One example to this is the conversion of food to growth and development. We, as we young, at young age, we eat food, we eat food, we activate what's called nutrient control pathway. And this allow us to grow and get a final size, but we stay in this size and we continue to accumulate higher food, amount of food than we need it. So if we have too much food, we activate these two pathways, which we spoke about them later, and these pathways, which are very important in young age, this is an insulin-like factor, and this is a tau factor that help us to grow and be, to, to reach a finest uh, size and to mature. But since we survive more than we expected, they continue to be act. And this overproduction or overfunction result in age-related pathology, vice versa. If I cut my calorie and I reduce this activity, I can delay aging and extend Lifespan. How do I know this is true? Simply because I can do mutation in these two genes and extend the lifespan of every organism that I'm doing it. I will show it to you in about a few minutes. So there is a simple answer to extend lifespan. You can just cut your calorie and live, uh, live longer. And actually we know it, it's called calorie restriction, it's called dietary restriction. We know it for the last almost a century. It was started in McGill by by a researcher namely, name, uh, namely McKay, that cut the calorie of rats and found out that they live 30% longer. But since then we can do it in mice, we can do it in rats, we can do it in dog, chicken, fish, even in monkeys and yeast, whatever model that you want. And once you cut the calorie by 30%, you extend the lifespan by 30% and also delay the appearance of age-related disease. If you Last week in science, there was a paper reporting in, in human about an experiment that is uh, for the last two years, it was done in human. Of course, we don't know yet if it uh, affects the lifespan because, because it was a very short experiment, but we do know that it affects the inflammation pathway in the body. This is, again, it's very nice to suggest that we can uh, eat less and live longer, but the world is getting fatter. It's not, it's, you don't need me to tell you this. For example, this is a heat map of a BMI across the world. Again, it's going from green to, to red. As it's become more red, it's meaning that the BMI is higher and about 40%, let's say 30% of the USA population have a obese BMI, which is, a, which is a represent obese condition. So it's not so easy to come to the population it doesn't eat less. There is a fact for being obese because this is a this is the different BMI. This is a normal BMI. This is pre-obese. This is obese, and you can see if you have BMI above forty-five, for example, you you lose twelve years out of your lifespan. What are the physiological damage of obesity? Physiological damage of obesity you can see them here. You have increased body fat, specifically abdominal body fat. Why, why I say specifically that? Because there are, two, there are several types of fat and what we call white adipose tissue, or white fat, is considered to be the bad fat. And there is an increase in abdominal fat, there's an increase in triglyceride, cholesterol, we develop type two diabetes as we become uh, obese, we have fatty liver, inflammation, even Alzheimer's disease, and cancer is also influenced by increase in uh, fat content in, the, in, in our body. So if I will take all everything that I just mentioned to you and I will take, try to summarize what are the mechanisms that control healthy, healthy lifespan, we can divide it into two. The maintenance or genome, what we call, I like to call genome stability, the rate is the, that you fix mutation. You have metabolism, I just mentioned the, the negative effect of obesity on lifespan. And these two basic mechanisms affect healthy aging and affect age. And what we try to do in my lab is to find a common mechanism that underlines these two 
and connected to aging. And in my lab, we focus on the protein that's called 36, and I'll explain to you in a second what is 36. 36 is a protein that exists in each of your cells, cells and in metabolism. It's a protein that, uh, that exists in human, but we started to be interested in this protein because previously when I was at Harvard, we worked about a protein that, uh, let's say, what's called homolog, it's brother protein, it's called CER2, that when you manipulate CER2 in yeast and in C. elegans, which is a worm, or in fly, you can affect the lysis. So in Israel, when I came back, we decided to focus on CER36. And since then, we know the following. First, 36 is involved in DNA repair. As I told you before, the DNA repair is very important for uh, determining your lysis. It's also involved in glucose homeostasis or glucose metabolism. It's involved also in obesity, telomer length, meaning that losing the, it's the clock that determine how many div uh, cell division you will have. We found that once you're doing dietary restriction, the level of 36, it's increased. It's important for stability of DNA for inflammation, your circadian clock, it's repressed cancer by repressing the Warburg effect. I'm not sure how much you're familiar with the Warburg effect. Otto Warburg was a Jewish scientist that lived in, in Germany at World War II. So it's a, it's a very interesting story. Hitler kept him alive because he thought that he will help him to solve cancer. And the Warburg effect, it's a fact that in which cancer cell take glucose slash sugar and use this in a different metabolic uh, pathway. And this, uh, this was found by Otto Warburg, he got a Nobel Prize. Cell six, fight against cancer by repressing the Warburg effect. So it's also involved in cancer, it's also involved in embryonic development. And if you don't have 36, it, uh, it's a prenatal lethality. It was shown also in monkey, and it was also in human. But we are focusing the, about the effect of cell six in age. So why do I have this uh, drawing here? Why, why do you see this mice open uh, yam soup? So when we started, we found out, as I said before, that the level of cell six increase, increases under dietary restriction. We cut the calorie, even in human, or, but we did it originally, we did it in, the, in the mice and also in red. And the level of cell six, six increase, suggesting that maybe we can mimic the effect of 36 by instead of doing dietary restriction, just by creating a mouse that have multiple copies of 36. Every time that we have a new mice model in my lab or we develop a new mice, we, we have a competition to choose name of this model. And this time, because it was a mice overexpressing exogenous 36, we call it Moses. And this is in, in the aging field, Moses is a very, famous uh, mouse model. So this was drawn by my daughter, it's AC. It's Avia Cohen, it's important to mention it. She drew it, do it 10 years ago. This year she's going to finish Bezalel. Bezalel is the best drawing school in Israel and she's going to finish it this year. I believe it started here, but she refused to admit it. Anyhow, so this is Moses and we are uh, focusing about the world of 36 by overexpressing it in mice and see what will be the, the result of it. The first thing that we did, we took the mice and fed them for almost uh, half a year with high fed diet. What do I mean by half a diet? We take them with the, the food and now instead of giving normal food, 60% of the diet of the calories in this food is fed. And the mice become extremely fed, as you can see here, unless you overexpress 36. For example, this is what's happened to the percentage of fat after six months, this is the effect in 36 overexpress. If we check all the, all the criteria of uh, obesity or the negative effect of obesity in this mice, we found that none of this effect happened when you overexpress 36. This was very encouraging because if you look at this list, Besides it, we, this suggests that we can develop the drug against obesity or the negative effect of obesity. What also very exciting in this was that each of these phenotypes happens also in age individual. For example, as we age, we, at the beginning, we have increased abdominal fat, we have increased body fat, there is an increased triglyceride, cholesterol, we develop type 2 diabetes, fatty liver, inflammation, 
Alzheimer, none of this happened when you're overexpressing 36. So the next thing that we did, of course, was to ask, would Moses reach 120? Can we affect the lifespan of mice, or let's say mammals, by overexpressing 36? And this is an experiment that we published almost a decade ago, the Michelle experiment that we published a, a, few, a few months ago. But here, for example, this is a, these are male mice. The, this overexpressing 36, this normal mice, and this, this is the survivors, this is the days, and they survive much longer than normal mice once you overexpress 36. This is what we published a few months ago. And here again, we changed the background of the, of the mice. And here in the male, we'll be able to extend the lifespan by 27%. In female, 15%. I can explain to you later what was the, why we, we think there is a difference between male and female. But in both uh, sexes, we'll be able to increase lifespan significantly. What is 27% in human life? It's mean if you were supposed to survive up to 90, now you will survive up to 120. And this, of course, is very impressive effect, but we are more concerned about healthy life We don't want it to individuals to survive, only to survive longer. We want them to be more healthier in the, when they become older. So we check the effect on healthy lifespan. And we found out the following. First, they are much less diabetic. Here, for example, we follow the, the uptake of glucose, which is a measurement for type 2 diabetes. And this is a very old mice, it's 28 months, 26 months old. So it's about age in human, it's 75 plus minus. And they get, accurate, take the, the glucose much better to the peripheral tissue in comparison to normal old mice. There's, if you compare the muscle by part of the body composition, the, the, the fat and the muscle, there is much less fat. And there were also we found effect on what we call long-term memory. So we use a specific way maze, and we can see that the old mice overexpressing 36 have improved long-term memory. This was the only effect that we found about the behavior. What's about activity? We found that mice more is that mice overexpressing 36 or more than mice are protected from the frailty syndrome. We did two types of activity, either voluntary activity, so we give them a running wheel and we follow the, the times that they run on the wheel, or force them to run on a treadmill. You can see it here. And these two mice are these are 24, 26 months old mice. These two are 36 overexpression, these two are the little mate which are normal mice. And you can see like old mice, they do not move, but cell six continue to run. So it's, so we, and not only they run, they didn't lose weight, they have the same muscle strength and so, so they are protected against the frailty syndrome. So, and not only that, they also have improved healthy liver as we publish in many other uh, publications. So the question that we have next was the very, was the following question. Can we see the whole picture? Why do I call it, can we see the whole picture? Because till this time of uh, the time point, we, we always focus on one gene, one effect, and trying to understand what's really 36 is doing. But as the time passed, we realized that the effect of 36 is very wide. And we need to create a situation that we can see the whole picture. For example, here there is a sequence of DNA. I don't know how many nucleotide, nucleotide the letters that they are here but it's definitely much less than the number of nucleotides or DNA that we have in each of your cells. Each one of us in every cell has 3.2 times 10 by nine nucleotide. Here I'm showing you, let's say 1,000. So we wanted to, to find or to, to, to explore the, the full picture of cell six overexpression. You can see it as that you see, if you focus on one gene, it's like you look on a note page, and you're trying to imagine what exactly is the music here, but we want to hear the full, the full melody of the, the orchestra, the whole orchestra, and to understand what's really happened when you're overexpressing 36. How we did it, we characterize all the genes that change due to 36, all the proteins that change due to 36, all the target, 36 is a, it's what we call enzyme. It's active, you have substance that is modified. We, 
characterize all the targets for 36, and we also did what's called metabolomics. What is called metabolomics? We use the sophisticated system that's called mass spectrometry, and we follow change in small molecules in the blood, in the brain, in the muscle, in the liver of mice overexpressing 36 when they are resting and the fasting and the exercise at young and old age. So now we can combine all this data to get the full picture of what 36 is doing. And of course, I'm not going to show you all the million pieces of data that we have here, but I want to show you only one. The, the main question is how, how can the 36 overexpressing mice are still active when they are old? Now, when you're doing physical activity, you need to find sources for your energy. Or if you're fasting, the same if you're fasting, you need to find sources for your energy. Or even when you sleep, you need to find sources for your energy. What is the basic coin of uh, energy? It's sugar, sugar or fat. And for example, here, when you fast, that's it, Yom Kippur, or soon it's going to be Tanit Esther. When you fast, there is a, at the beginning, you have this level of glucose, and then it's drop, and then your body creates your glucose from other sources. Then after a few hours, you don't have the sources, and it's declining again. This is what's happening in young mice or young individuals. At old age, we have failed to generate glucose when we fast or when we train, and when you have exercise and so on. When you overexpress 36 and look at the dash line, the green one, they actually create energy exactly like young mice. And we found that 36 has the ability when you are exhausted or when you are old to take resources for energy and to produce energy even at old age. And we published the mechanism how exactly he's doing it. He's doing it either by generating again glucose, what we call gluconeogenesis, or by burning more fat. And what we call, it's a, in, in scientific terms, it's called better oxidation of free fatty acids. These two sources allow us, if we have overexpression of 36, to, to stay active even at time that we are exhausted and we don't have enough energy like in aging. If we summarize everything that we learned, we, learn, we, we now believe that 36 sit in the middle of many metabolic pathways. We call it a juggler and just uh, rewiring the metabolic network to young situation. So this was the scientific part of my, of what, or the, the scientific finding, but the challenge is how 36 mediates this activity. What is the connection to aging? And if we go here, how can we translate it into human? Whatever I show you up to now, whether it was 36 or what I mentioned, briefly mentioned IGF-1 and I mentioned a color restriction and I mentioned TOR, all of this, how can you translate it into, into human? It's very nice that we have result, or even excellent result in, in a model organism and it shows that what you ask yourself is, how can I do it in human? So I will give you some brief uh, introduction of what's happened across the, the world in trying to develop anti-aging drug based on the scientific knowledge that we just mentioned to you now. So I spoke about calorie restriction. Now we don't need to do calorie restriction. You don't necessarily need to cut your calorie by 40% as you do in mice in order to, to extend the lifespan and to improve the metabolic profile. You can do other methods. For example, you can do time-restricted feeding, meaning that you eat only a specific time of, of the day. You can, give them a, you can give them diet, which mimic calorie restriction. You can do in human, what's that? You can do five to two. And you can do it in mice. In mice, you get a very nice result. And this is the basic why people are doing it in human. You have three days that you eat, no, let's call it normally, in two days that you eat, limited amount of calorie. In other words, what's called a 16, 16 to eight, so 16 hours. And it's important to say it this way. 16 hours, you don't eat, you can drink. And eight hours, you eat, you can do it whatever you like, or you can cut it to have a specific diet. But this gives you a very similar, it's not exactly the same, but it gives you a close enough effect as in color restriction because you are now doing what 36 did. You burn more fat and you increase and you're able to 
to, to mimic the starvation response and survive better. The other way to do it is to get rid of dead cells into, in your body. I didn't say it before, but as we age, we accumulate senescent cells. Senescent cells are cells that die, but they don't really die. They're like zombie cells. They sit there, they're still active, and they decline slowly during your age. Why, why do we want to, to get rid of them? Because it's not important so much about the, the, that this cell die, it's important what this cell secrete. And as we age, we fail to get rid of these cells and they keep secreting. This is how these cells look. This is a bit structure. These cells secrete negative factor that result in aging of the whole tissue. And we fail to get rid of them. So there are many companies these days that are trying to develop the same as this experiment did, method to get rid specifically out of senescent cells, even as we age. For example, this was done in mice. They, they took mice that age prematurely. You see, they have a hypothesis and they have senescent cells that secreted this factor that killed the other cells. And they get rid of these senescent cells. They're able to extend the lifespan of these mice by 10% plus minus. And now there's a list of say, companies that try to develop what's called senolytic. It's a drug that, call, that will kill senescent, senescent cells. This is one way to do it. Another way to do it, if, if you remember, I mentioned before that if we eat more, we activate TOR and we activate IGF-1, two pathways. We can take drug, it's called rapamycin. It's a very old drug. It's, and TOR actually, it's called target of rapamycin and inhibit the activity of TOR. And you can, if you give it to any organism, for example, this is mice, you can extend the lifespan. It was done in multiple organisms these days. There is a, a wild, a wide, wide experiment to do it in dog, but also there's experiments that the finding the FDA allowed to do it also in human to give them rapamycin to see what will happen if you give all the individuals rapamycin, what will happen to the lifespan and to the health span. Keep in mind, this is quite, uh, it's, a, it's a very old uh, drug and, and it's important not to give it at young age because it's repressed the activity of TOR, so it's repressed development. But at old age, it will repress mTOR, and this is supposed to give a beneficial effect. Another way to do it is to give metformin. Metformin, maybe you have, this is the name in Hebrew, it's called glucophaginism. Metformin, it's an anti-diabetes uh, drug. It's, well, it's the most subscribed uh, drug against type 2 diabetes in the US, also in Israel, across the world. And it's a very safe and all the, all the drug that beside health with diabetes also was shown to, to activate AMPK. It's a protein that act, that's become active under color restriction. And Neil Basel, and Neil Basel is a former Israeli scientist, now he's living in New York. He, he has now a, a large scale experiment that he convinced the FDA, it was more easy because this is a approved drug, to give it to all the individuals. Of course, these individuals are not diabetic because if you are diabetic, uh, it's not a kun, so it's, it's nothing, uh, the fact that you improve diabetic my, uh, individual's health, it's not, this we already know. So give it to individuals who are around age 70, it follows the health criteria, and he's doing it in individuals who are not diabetic. Another way to, to improve lifespan, and this is, uh, also drugs that you can find to be developed across the, uh, many companies is by boosting NAD. NAD is a molecule that is important to us for our biochemistry reaction in the body to maintain uh, all the met metabolic pathways that I mentioned before. And with age, it's declined. It's also important to activate 36, for example. So there is several attempts to give people NMN or NR, which are natural, for the precursor of NAD, uh, part of this uh, part of the, the, the generate NAD. And by this improves the lifespan, it was shown very nicely in mice that once you give them NMN and NR, you can, uh, you can extend the lifespan, you can extend the healthy lifespan. You can also, if you like, instead of buying NMN or buy NR, you can just uh, get it from vegetable or uh, different type of food, for example, for broccoli, but I, for you, I calculated 
how much broccoli you need to eat each day for a normal individual, it's 16 kilogram. I think it's, I doubt if anyone will survive more than a week with this diet. So this is another way that people, that the companies are developing drug against aging. And what we did in bar -Ilan, we established a company. Uh, it's now out of my lab, it's already exists. It's called 30 Lab. And this company, <coughs> sorry, we develop drugs that will activate 36. We are not the only ones, there are other companies, uh, high, very large uh, bio biotech companies that are trying to do the same. But at least as far as I know, we're quite ahead of them because we started before we have two, several types, we have patents of this that uh, for methods that will activate 36. And now we are in the preclinic uh, stage of developing this drug. So that's what I have to tell you about developing of a anti-aging drug. I believe that let's say in the coming years, we have more and more anti-aging drug that will benefit humanity. But everything just, just told you Today was done by my students. This every few months we have a trip in Israel. This is in Emeka Mayanot, if you're familiar with it. It's next to Enanatsiv, it's next to Tiratsvi, it's two kibbutzim. And this is the motto of the lab. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Ruben. Thank you very much. It was very, very impressive and very interesting. Guys, do you have some questions, comments? Please unmute yourself and uh, ask. Yes, thank you, for, thank you very much for your time. Um, Maureen, are you able to just turn it back to gallery mode for everyone, take off the spotlight so maybe uh, people, you can see? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. There we go. All right, does uh, anyone have questions for the good professor? Oh, a lot of yeah, I have Dr. one. Cohen. Oh. Oh, go ahead, Ronnie, you're good. Um, has there been studies done on using metformin in people who are not diabetic? Are there downsides to it? Okay, to the best of my, it's the, I'm very, uh, I would say it this way. The, the result of this experiment was, was didn't publish yet. So it, I cannot say there's any downs uh, or negative effect for, uh, for getting metformin at old age. Based on the knowledge that we have on basic uh, experiment or let's say the model organism, it's extended the lifespan of many organisms. But as far as I, as far as I remember in human, there was a debate whether there are some negative effect of taking metformin. And the, let's say the bottom line, is there are more positive effects than negative effects. There were some cases about cancer, but now these days, I think there is a, the common a concept is that metformin also act in many, as anti-cancer in many type of cancer. But I can Thank give you. the email of Neil Barzila, you can ask him. I don't want to comment about other people experiment, but he didn't publish yet the, the outcome of TAME. TAME is the, na the name of this experiment, so I cannot say if it's work or didn't. Thank you. Yeah, I was also going to ask a question about metformin. Um, many doctors prescribe it to patients to, you know, prophylactically prevent high sugar. If you're already taking metformin for that, would they recommend more to prevent aging or you're already good? <laughs> I don't know the answer for this. I'm sorry. It's metformin, it's I don't know the answer, but if, if it's I think that the amount that they give to in this experiment is the same that the concentration as they, they give to a common uh, patient. So I so I can I cannot say that the more metformin that you will have, it will be a better effect. Thank you. Anybody else? Susan, unmute yourself. Yes. Yeah. Karen, no, I did. I didn't have anything specific to ask. No, no, um, no, no, Susan, no, no. Susan, Susan, Susan. Susan. 
Yeah. The other Susan, Susan Mark. Yes, sorry. Um, where does genetics come into this? Um, if you have a family, you know, with good longevity and they've never taken any of these uh, drugs and they actually always enjoyed a lot of sugar in their diet, um, how does that play out? Did you change okay. one's lifestyle? Okay, so going like this. There are two sides for this, uh, to the answer to this question, okay? The first is that if you look, when people are centenarian, centenarian which is an individual who reached age 100, we have a specific uh, group that's called centenarian, that which are individual who reach age 100, you can find, if, if you investigate the genome, you can, you can find specific change in the sequence, which are associated with increased lifespan. For example, you have a variant in IGF-1 that I mentioned before, there's one variant, variant meaning change. There's one variant in 36 sequence. There's variant in APOE, which is important to, to your blood pressure. So you can find markers in the, in the DNA sequence of these individuals that are associated with increased longevity. Okay, this is one, one way to look at it. And also if you check the, the family or the children of these individuals, they look younger, they have better, um, better appearance and so on. If I remember the, the paper that are better physiological parameters. Yet, if you want to ask what's happened about habits like smoking and uh, eating too much and so on, whether these individuals, you can point all of these individuals who reach age 100, all of them didn't smoke, didn't uh, eat uh, a lot of fat, and uh, avoid the, uh, I don't know, the kiddush, and I eat only the water after the, the prayer and Shabbat, I don't think it's the, the case. Actually, many of them smoke and many of them have a bad habits. So it's part of the genetic that uh, helps them to survive rather than their behavioral, or the behaviors that help them to survive long. Besides that, you can see that this is the genetic part. Besides, gen it's going to be more and more complex, I apologize. Beside the genetics is what we call epigenetics. Epigenetics mean factors that regulate the expression of your, of your genome, but are not part of your sequence. For example, is the way that your DNA is, is, a, is a organized determine what, which, how exactly it's going to be expressed. If it's, it's, if it's a, what we call heterochromatin, it's, it's a lot of protein sit on this area, this area will not be expressed. It's less protein, surround a specific area in the DNA, this area will be expressed. And factors that control the expression of genes, which are not part of the genes called epigenetic, there's also another level of epigenetics regulation of age. Now, this is regarding the genetic part of age. Nevertheless, you need to remember that aging in many ways, it's still a stochastic event. So in other words, it starts from a signal uh, event that accumulates during your life. And this stochastic event, this can be influenced a lot, influenced a lot by the environment and also by genetics. If we go back to model organism, and we go very back to, to yeast. In yeast, we know what exactly is the mechanism of aging in yeast. There is a release of a circular DNA molecule that accumulate and kill the yeast. And this is a stochastic event. It's happened early, it can happen early or later in the life, but specific genes will control the release of this circular DNA and will determine the lifespan of this organism. So you have the genetic part of it, you have the environment, the environmental part of it, but you also have that's a, the goral or the stochastic part of this event that just happened during your life and start a snowball that will be a expressive end. Thank you. <laughs> Helen, uh, Helen, unmute yourself and uh, turn, turn on your microphone. Yes. Perfect. Um, uh, Professor Cohen or Dr. Cohen, you happen to have the same name as my late father, Hyam Cohen. Um, 
One of the uh, statements I have to make, no one in my family lived to my age. And when I look back and reflect, I mean, I've, uh, my mother always told me that she nursed me till I was age 26 months, which is quite a, uh, you know, I was all past two years of age. Uh, sometimes I connect I mean, I, I, you know, bless God and all the other blessings, but I am 90 years of age, and I attribute to that. I have no one in the family to really draw a comparison. Toby, don't look shocked. <laughs> shocked? No. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that expression. I, and also, I want to comment about metformin. Uh, one doctor in town had placed me on that, and I was like a zombie, and I'm a very motivated individual. And fortunately, I have another physician, and it took me off that immediately. So I don't see the benefits. But, uh, Professor Cohen, your comments. It's okay, so regarding the metformin, I can uh, comment immediately, because I sent a WhatsApp to message to near Barzillai, while you ask me the question, and I ask him, what's happened to individuals who get metformin, if it's good to, uh, to give them more, more metformin? And I will try to translate it, uh, not to open my phone, but I will try to translate what he said, not necessarily metformin, if it's too much of metformin, it can harm the mitochondria, so there is a threshold that you don't want to pass. I think it's a regard, it's a, there are some individuals actually lose energy with metformin and you need to stop giving the metformin. So this is what it all, it just sent me now. So I think it's fit to what you just discussed. So it's not good to everyone. And it's too much of this. Will, this also to the question who asked me for, it, it's, it will also will have a negative, at high level, it will have a negative effect. So this has come directly from the individuals that uh, study metformin. Regarding uh, breastfeeding, I don't know, it's, it's, I cannot comment how long you need it to survive longer in, later in your life. I can definitely say that during the 20th century, we, or the, the beginning of the 21st century, there is one of the major uh, reasons why we were able to extend our lifespan is because we were able to reduce the amount of uh, infection. And this is the, the, the real reason why there is such a jump in human life, and maybe this is related to the diet that, they, that you have Can while you were young. Does, does any, I know you talked about steps that um, um, delay sure. aging. Are there any steps that reduce it at all? You mean avoid it completely? No, no, no. I mean, sort of like take you back a little bit. Regeneration, okay. Um, I am aware of two experiments that were that were able to show regeneration of age. It's very complex. So aging at the end, or a lot of condition in aging is a chronic situation mm -hmm. that develop as you as you as you become older. It's not something that just happened. Uh, it's not something that is, there's no one zero situation for aging. It's a chronic situation that accumulate as you age. For example, like diabetes and other diseases that uh, it's a chronic diseases. They become more and more worse as you become old. But there are two experiments that were done to show that, that show, at least that's one of them, that you can definitely call it reversing of aging. This was experiments that were done by, by expressing three factors in, in, in the eye and help the, the nerve to recover, or let's say to have a regeneration of the nerve in the eye. And these are the, the four, just give us some history. There are four factors, they call the Yamanaka factor. Yamanaka got Nobel Prize for it because these are the four factors that you can use them to create stem cells. And what they did in this experiment, they took, they used three out of these factors because one of them, it's oncogenic factor and they used the other three and they inject it into the mouse uh, retina and they were able to, uh, to rescue the nerve of, uh, of the eye and by this restoring, the function of the eye. So this is, we can call it regeneration, or let's say reversing the, 
the direction of aging. The other, most of the other experiments that we do, it's very difficult to distinguish between regeneration or slowing, slowing aging. I believe that most of it is just slow the rate of aging rather, just, rather than flip the direction of, a, of the aging process. And there is also other uh, evidence that people using a hyperbaric chamber that they claim that this helps them to have regeneration of uh, okay, regeneration of the of the telomere. Telomere is the end of the chromosome that determine how many cell cycles your cells will undergo. And once they did the hyperbaric chamber, this extends the uh, the telomere length, and by this it claims that this some type of regeneration. Uh, now when I speak, you think about it, we, uh, if you take people who exercise and you follow the, what's called the methylation clock, it's a clock of how old you are based on methylation in the DNA. And after exercise also the world, if they took white blood cells for people who did exercise, now the clock become younger, even though before it represents a, it, either older or the real uh, biological, uh, not biological, chronological age. So there's three examples that you can speak about regeneration, but up to date, we don't have any example that you stop uh, aging, reverse everything, and now you have a uh, young individual as before. You can find it in, a, in, a, in literature, but this is a, this is a novel, it's not really in science. I do have another question. Elaine raised an interesting um, issue. She's energetic and she seeks out opportunities in the world. Are there studies that have been done about in people being engaged and also extending their life span? People who are what, sorry? People who are engaged, active, interested, doing things, oh. not, just, you know, not just exercise, but doing things that are actually mentally engaging. I guess I get your point. Um, it's not my area of uh, research, but if, it's a, if, if you look, and I'm a bit precocious about it, if, if you check what's called the mental case condition, I think it's have, it definitely helped the mental condition. Where does this also help the physiological condition? I'm not sure because I, I don't have the knowledge yeah. the information to tell you about. I assume that once you improve your mental condition, this also affect your, some criteria of your physiological behavior, and this will affect your physiology in general. But I don't want to come and say, if you do, if you will uh, do Sudoku all day, this will make you much more active <laughs> at the end of it. Darn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Cohen, and thank you, everyone, for being with us, and thank you for participation. And I think it was very, 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 very interesting, and from educational perspective and in general. And uh, thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.